Hi there, this is Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films and welcome to another episode of Film Stock. Today's episode is called That Sounds Like a Film By But It's Not. Now this was suggested or prompted by commenter Mr Ed. I don't know whether that's the famous Mr Ed or just Mr Ed. On my boutique label battle video for Mate Wan, Mr Ed mentioned that the Malagro Beanfield War was the most John Sayles film that wasn't written or directed by John Sayles. So I've made a little list of films that you maybe think were directed by somebody other than who they were directed by, if that makes any sense. Now, obviously, I have all these films in my collection. This is just a bit of fun. I'm not complaining about who directed these films, because the films are all fantastic. But when I think of these films, perhaps another director pops into my head. And this is a game that you can all play at home, if you think of films that seem to be right up a director's alley but they didn't actually direct it. So as Mr Ed suggested the Malagro Beanfield War is a completely John Sayles type film even though it's directed by Robert Redford and has nothing to do with John Sayles. Um, the story of a small farming community fighting back against um, oppressive land developers. It's got an all-star cast. Um, Sonia Braga, John Heard, Daniel Stern, Chick Ventura, Melanie Griffith, Christopher Walken, Ruben Blades. Um, it has several characters who are well-written and their stories interlink with each other. It's beautifully shot. Um, it's just, it is almost whimsical. There's a kind of fairy tale element to it as well. And it would be a fitting film in the John Sayles canon, except it's not a John Sayles film, directed by Robert Redford. It's probably my favourite Robert Redford, perhaps that, or Quiz Show. So I think that was a brilliant choice by Mr Ed. The following choices probably aren't going to be as good as the Malangro Beanfield War. But I'm going to go through them and try and explain myself. Again, this is just a bit of fun. This is not to be taken too seriously. Again, I'm not knocking the director of the film. Um, but again, this is really an exercise to jog everybody's memory out there. And I want I would quite like to see your suggestions in the comments below. So the next one again, it's a fairly obvious one. I know you're not supposed to talk about Woody Allen, but Woody Allen's Play It Again Sam, which is completely a Woody Allen film, written by Woody Allen, starring Woody Allen, but directed by Herbert Ross. This was pretty much because it was shot on the West Coast, and Woody Allen hates the West Coast, so he didn't want to direct it. Um, I think there was issues with West Coast crews, so he got Herbert Ross, who co-wrote some of his early work, to direct it. But that's completely a Woody Allen film, just not directed by Woody Allen. Um, next is a film that stars, or two films that star Max von Sydow and Liv Ullmann as Swedes who move to America. It's in two parts. One is 191 minutes long. And the other one is 202 minutes long. And of course that's Ingmar Bergman's The Immigrants in the New Land. Except it wasn't directed by Ingmar Bergman. 
It was directed by Jan Troll. Again, these are two wonderful films, and again, this is not knocking Jan Troll, but it sounds like it's an Ingmar Bergman film, or two films. Um, the Emigrants and the New Land, made in 1971 and 1972, based on huge novels, both in reputation and size in Sweden. Um, full of nature and the struggle. Um, the trip across the ocean seems to go on forever, not just for the audience, but the actual participants. Not everybody makes it. Um, they are two difficult films, but once you get into the kind of rhythm of them, they become quite fascinating and everyday tasks become quite fascinating. So, I mean, you've got two Bergman heavyweights. Obviously, they made other films that weren't just in Bergman films. Um, but they're two films by Jan Troll, who I haven't seen any of his other films. But they sound a, bit, a little bit like Bergman. Again, it's just a bit of fun. So, obviously... 1985, To Live and Die in L.A., the Michael Mann film that's not a Michael Mann film. It's directed, written, co-written and directed by William Friedkin. Obviously it has William Peterson, who a year later would be in The Almighty Manhunter. Um, it uses L.A. locations, the way Mann uses L.A. locations, as far as we see parts of L.A. we've never seen before. It has an 80s score. It's about intense people. Willem Dafoe and John, pa John Pankoff and William Peterson. Um, being very intense and moody. So it's kind of like a Michael Mann film. But directed by William Friedkin. Again, I'm not knocking Willy Boy. Um... But it almost seems like a Michael Mann film. Next is a really obvious one. Glengarry Glen Ross. Written by David Mamet. Based on his Pulitzer Prize winning play. And directed by James Foley. Not David Mamet. Um, James Foley does a really good job though. I mean it's one of my favourite films of all time. It's the only film that I had on audio tape. That I would listen to the cassette. Just for the dialogue. I'm that sad. Obviously, David Mamet has directed many, many films. I'm not quite sure why he didn't get to direct Glengarry Glen Ross, but James Foley, again, shoots it probably a lot differently than David Mamet would do. It's very claustrophobic. It's very in-your-face. Again, it's one of my favourite films of all time. Again, this is not knocking the directors who actually made the films. But if you weren't paying attention, you would think, well... Mamet must have directed Glengarry Glen Ross because he wrote it and it's his play. Next is Tushy Power Grisby um, with Jean Gabin, Jean Moreau and Lino Ventura. Um, an early proto Jean-Pierre Melville but it was directed by Jack Becker. The wonderful Jack Becker who in the last year, 18 months, have really got into his films and they're all pretty much marvellous. I'm not a huge fan of Edward and Caroline, just what it's about, but um, all his other films, La True, Castor, fantastic. And again, this one is probably a proto-Melville, even though Melville probably took quite a lot from Becker's work. And again, off the top of your head, the look of it, just that feeling of melancholy... Um, the way it's shot, it's black and white, so it doesn't have those kind of pastel, melancholy colours that some of Melville's films do have. But again, on first blush, if you didn't know who directed it, you might think it's a Melville in tone. But it's such a great Becker film, if you haven't seen it, I would certainly recommend it. Tucci Power Grisby, which is basically hands off the loot, I believe, essentially. Um, Again, the end of an era for kind of older gangsters bringing in a kind of new breed of gangster. It's just a wonderful film. 
that again, if you weren't looking properly, you'd think, maybe that's a Melville, but it's not, it's a Becker. Next, I had to get one imprint in here, didn't I? Um, it's the Assassination Bureau Limited, because as um, Kim Newman points out in one of the extras, lots of people just call it the Assassination Bureau, but it's actually the Assassination Bureau Limited. And if you watch this film, you would think it was made by Richard Lester, but it's actually Basil Dearden, the veteran director. This is 1968, no, 1969, with Diana Rigg and Oliver Reed and Telly Savalas. It's an absolute blast. Literally, it's about an assassination bureau um, set just before World War One, and Telly Savalas. Well, Oliver Reed is the head of the Assassination Bureau. Um, Diana Rigg is the journalist who puts a hit out on him. And the rest of the Assassination Bureau Limited have to try and knock him off or he knocks them off. And Telly Savalas wants to start World War I and take over the world. It's an absolute blast. Very much like Richard Lester's top films like Bed Sitting Room and um, Royal Flash and How I Won the War. There's a anarchic tone to it. Perhaps it's got too many ideas going on at once. It is a lot of fun. It's eminently rewatchable. Um, this imprint release was one of those imprints that I just had to get. It perhaps didn't live up completely to the idea of what it would be, cause, but it's pretty damn close. It's not perfect, but it's a whole load of fun. Oliver Reed, Diana Rigg, Telly Savalas, a host of character actors, globetrotting, Zeppelins. It's just fantastic. And again, you'd think it was maybe directed by Richard Lester, but it's directed by... Basil Dearden, and that is the Assassination Bureau Limited. Next is the Bad Sleepwell. This is obviously by Kurosawa, and I wouldn't have suggested this until you know the last year where I have watched these films by Kobayashi because you can be forgiven for thinking. This is a Kobayashi film. Perhaps not in the immaculate framing that Kurosawa does, but if you have seen this set of films by Kobayashi, which is The Thick Walled Room, I Will Buy You, Black River and The Inheritance. If you haven't, I would highly recommend them. The tone, the cynical nature um, of The Bad Sleep Well, as one man tries to find his father's killer in the world of big business that tone the kind of um, not necessarily satire but just exposing the corruption um, that is very Kobayashi in those films in that set so that's the only reason I would mention Kobayashi in The Bad Sleep Well next this is just a quirky odd one it's Bellman and True. Again, I just like to have excuses to talk about Bellman and True. Um, a lovely British film from 1987 about a father who gets embroiled with bank robbers and they have his son as a hostage. And again, the tone is very Neil Jordan or Stephen Frears, but it was directed by Richard Longcrane who would go on to do Richard III with Ian McKellen. Um, this is maybe a little idiosyncratic choice, but it just has that feel of a Jordan film or a Stephen Frears film, even though it's Richard Longcrane. Next is Alan J. Pakula's The Conversation. Well, it's not because it's Francis Ford Coppola's Conversation. But when you consider Pakula cornered the market on 70s paranoia with Clute and the Parallax View and All the President's Men, then the conversation fits 
quite nicely into that quartet. But of course it's not a Pakula film, it's a Coppola film. Next, it's Bill Forsyth's Restless Natives. Not written or directed by Bill Forsyth, of course. Um, this charming little film about two Scottish lads um, who want a bit of excitement in their lives, dress up as a clown and a wolf man and rob tourist buses, has got Bill Forsyth written all over it, even though it's nothing to do with Bill Forsyth. Um, this was directed by Michael Hoffman, co-starring Ned Beatty. And I remember seeing this in the cinema when it actually came out. Um, it's an absolute joy. It's one of those wonderful little British gems and Scottish gems that Bill Forsyth produced. Um, but of course it's not Bill Forsyth. But you might be mistaken for thinking it's a Bill Forsyth film after watching it. Now this one is just a bit of silliness. Because I know somebody, when this film is brought up, says, June, that film directed by David Lean. So obviously this is not a kind of film directed by David Lean, but I just bring it up because I know somebody who always says that's directed by David Lean, not David Lynch. David Lean's June, obviously, um, this one's about an hour and... What, 20 minutes? An hour and 25 minutes? Obviously, David Lean's Dune would have been four hours long. Maybe we should have seen that, I don't know. But that's just a personal one. Um, next is Andrew Nichols' Gattaca, which, if you look at it in an odd light, could have been David Cronenberg's Gattaca. About genetics, um about being valid or invalid, lots of nice tech, it sounds nice, it looks wonderful, it's a film of ideas that I think is really underrated, and again written and directed by Andrew Nichol, but in a certain light, if you had certain, um, if you were imbibing of certain things, you could maybe go that might be a David Cronenberg film. Again, just a bit of fun. Next is Attack with Jack Palance and Lee Marvin. Directed by Robert Aldridge, but it really feels like a Sam Fuller. I mean, Jack Palance threatens to put to um, ram hand grenades down people's throats and pull the pin. Um, Lee Marvin is just on top form. Robert Aldridge is fantastic, but the film does have a feel of a Samuel Fuller film. Um, but again, it's a wonderful film by Aldridge. But it's just got a little bit of Fuller sensibility and slight oddness um, that was kind of his trademark. But it's an absolutely fantastic little war film for like zero budget. Um, Palance and Eddie Albert and um, Lee Marvin are absolutely fantastic. And then finally, truly just for a bit of fun, I mean I have kind of suggested in these alternate universes that the other filmmakers made these films, they are all working around the same time, so it's not as if I'm saying Charlie Chaplin would direct a film from 2020 or something. But this one, I'm being deliberately facetious. So this is Ed Wood's The Happening. Made in 2008. Um, it might actually be Ed Wood's finest film. Um, even though it's apparently directed by M. Night Shyamalan. One of the most bizarre acting, not just by like one person, by the whole cast. Um, I'm sure Ed Wood would actually be proud of a film called The Happening. Um, and the tone of the film and the way it's performed um, is pure Ed Wood and a fitting tribute by M. Night Shyamalan 
to the career of Edward. So that's the happening. Again, this list is just a bit of fun. This alternate universe where these films are directed by other directors. So please let me know in the comments below what films you can think of that sound like a film directed by a certain director, but they weren't. So it's not projects that a director dropped out of and somebody else took over. It's films that are in the milieu or feel like one director, but it was actually directed by another director. If any of that makes any sense. So thanks very much for watching. Remember, this is not a knock on the directors that actually made the films. This is just a fun little exercise prompted by commenter Mr Ed. So thanks very much for that prompt. It's a very interesting idea. Obviously I haven't done the exercise very well and I'm sure people out there will do it much better than me and I would like to see them in the comments, please. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Filmstock. Hopefully you'll join me again for more rambling nonsense. This is Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films saying farewell. <laughs>